Good morning. All right, we are in uh, Psalm, uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, reading Psalm 17 today. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll read the scripture for today. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your mercy and your provision in our lives. Thank you for your word that uh, you use to um, bring us into obedience to you, to show us what it looks like to be obedient and to reveal your character to us, um, to show us how much we need you, and to also show us that you have made a way um, that you can, uh, that we can be in your presence, that you can stand our presence because of your son Christ. So as we read your scripture, always help us to keep that dependence upon you foremost in our thoughts, and uh, we pray that it would move us uh, to a, a love, a dependence, and obedience um, to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and read Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From your presence let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me, and you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. With regards to the works of, a man, of man, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adver adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world who, whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children, mm -hmm. and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. All right, God's word to us today in the book of Psalms. All right, so let's observe what is um, being written, communicated in this psalm. We read that uh, David is asking the Lord to hear a just cause and to behold the right. <clears throat> He says that God has tried his heart and tested him. David says that he has avoided the ways of the violent, that his feet have held fast to God's paths. He is confident that God will answer him. He is asking God to show his steadfast love and hide him in the shadow of his wings. He describes his enemies as arrogant and pitiless, lurking in ambush. He asks again for the Lord to confront and subdue the wicked. He describes what the wicked have received from the Lord. And then he describes what he will receive from the Lord. As we read this, often the Psalms um, can seem like a uh, disjointed jumble of ideas kind of all crammed together. But if we spend time with the psalm, we start to see the Lord's hand um, guiding the psalmist in continuity of thought, even despite the seeming um, disconnectedness. Right? And there are also ideas that can seem, seem contrary at a first reading to what we might know of Scripture um, and of the human condition, for instance. The big question here uh, on a first reading of this that you might have is, does David really think he's blameless? Does David really believe that he has done no evil in his life? Um, and so in consideration of that question, I think it's, it's important to, to try to understand where in David's life this takes this psalm was written like at what point in his life and also what specifically is he speaking of is he speaking about 
his life in general, or if he, is he speaking about a certain circumstance? So most likely, uh, this was written when David was running from Saul, when he was dealing with Saul's persecution of him. So this was somewhat early in his life. Not to say that up to this point he was blameless. Anyway, he was still a sinner, just like everyone else. But I think it is not that David is speaking in general terms about his innocence in his life generally, but in his innocence in this circumstance. And I think it's also important for us to understand that we can't just claim David's uh, statements at three through five for ourselves because we somehow feel we're blameless. David was inspired in the writing of this psalm. David was empowered by the Lord to act blamelessly in this situation. He was not blameless in the rest of his life, <laughs> certainly. There, there, there are certainly things that we can be blameless in. But it is not necessarily appropriate for us to claim this blanket blamelessness in our life. That's not what David's doing. Or to even assume that in one circumstance or another we are completely blameless. I think we can look to evidence and cry out to God in this way. But our cry should be, that he test us and know if there's any wicked way in us. What we see here is that he has, he's, he's saying that God has tried his heart, that God has tested him and will find nothing. This testing has already gone on. And what he's saying is, you have tested me and moving forward you will find nothing. Because I have committed that I'm going to, I'm I'm going to avoid the ways of the violent. I'm going to hold fast in my steps to your path. This is partially an acknowledgement that God has tried His heart, but then also a commitment moving forward that He's going to be blameless as much as is in His power. Right? You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me. And you will find nothing. He didn't say he, God has found nothing. Only that God will find nothing. That he is committing to the Lord that he is going to be blameless. Especially in this issue. <clears throat> and then he says he will call upon the Lord. Um... And he's going to seek refuge in the Lord. Now, he describes his plight and argues for his innocence in it, especially moving forward, that he's going to do everything he can to remain innocent, that he has been innocent and he wants to remain innocent in this um, interaction, presumably with Saul. And that's verses 3 through 5. So he's arguing um, for his innocence and he's describing his plight to the Lord. Then in verses 6 through 9, he expresses his confidence that, um, that God loves and saves those who seek refuge in him. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. There's a confidence here. You'll answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love. So he knows God is a God of steadfast love. O Savior of those who seek refuge, from their adversaries at your right hand. So those people who seek refuge at his right hand from their adversaries. He is the savior of those people. And then he asks, keep me as the apple of your eye. Keep me. So he believes himself already to be the apple of God's eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. So he's crying out, He's expressing confidence in the Lord, that the Lord is good, that he loves, is merciful, that he gives protection to those who seek refuge in him. Then in 10 through 12, David changes gears or switches perspective and he's describing these enemies who are surrounding him. They close their hearts to pity. 
they have to take no pity on the weak, on those who are oppressed, right? On um, especially those who are seeking the refuge in the Lord. But they close their heart, hearts to pity. With their mouths, they speak arrogantly, right? So they're trusting themselves. They have surrounded our steps, David and his crew. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground, so they're seeking to overpower David, someone who is attempting to be, remain blameless in this situation. He is like a lion eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush. So this this is the way he's describing these uh, the, his adversaries, his enemies, um, and he's indicting the evil right, by describing the way they behave, the way they think, which is contrary to the way they should behave before the Lord. It's actually very different from the way David describes the way he is trying to walk upright and hold fast to the paths of the Lord. These men are arrogant, eager for violence, ambushing. They have no pity. And we know that the Lord is a Lord of steadfast love. He, is, um, he hides the ones who seek refuge un, in the shadow of his wings, so he has pity, but these men don't. Um, and then what's really strange, it seems very strange, as he goes from this, he again asks the Lord to confront this wicked man and subdue him, to deliver David from the wicked, Except then he describes what the Lord is giving to these men. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. And what is the portion they have in this life? You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children. What greater blessing could you have than children? And, and they have abundance so much so that they leave it and provide their, uh, for their infants. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, it seems that these men are dying early because they're, they're uh, leaving their abundance to their infants, but I don't think that's the point of this passage. God is er, David is describing that the Lord is giving all these seemingly good things to these men who are wicked while it is David who's asking for God to show him mercy, that, um, that the Lord's presence might vindicate him. So is this justice? How is this justice? If God is a God of justice, how is this a demonstration of his holy justice? Well, first we need to ask, where does vindication come from? Where does justice come from? And according to who is justice dispensed? Well, verse, um, verse 2, from your presence, from the Lord's presence, let my vindication come. It is from the Lord that justice comes, and vindication comes from the presence of the Lord. And then we ask ourselves, as this psalm is closed, um, brought to an end by David. What does David um, find his satisfaction in? What is he satisfied with? What does he get? He's asking for much. What does he get? And how does that compare to what the wicked are getting? Well, he describes at the end, that he shall behold your face in righteousness. So he shall behold the face of the Lord in righteousness, not in judgment. So the face of the Lord is righteous, but David will also behold his face in righteousness. He will be in righteousness as he beholds the face of the Lord. Is there a greater gift to receive? And then he, he said, when he awakes, he shall be satisfied with the Lord's likeness. Does this mean that he will get to see the face of the Lord? 
be in his presence? I think likely, yes. But also perhaps he's saying that he himself will display the likeness of God. And because he is displaying the likeness of God, this is why he will be able to behold the face of God in righteousness. He will stand before the judge and he will be found righteous and he will not be cast out of the Lord's presence. He will be able to remain there and be satisfied with the likeness of the Lord. Not so for the wicked. All these good gifts, seemingly gracious gifts that they've received from the Lord, they have not sought the face of the Lord through those. They have not obeyed the commands of the Lord as they are given these good things. And so when they stand before the Lord, the judge of all, those good gifts will condemn them. And what seemed like grace will actually be judgment. And when they stand and behold the face of the Lord in his righteousness, they will not be found righteous. They will stand in judgment. They will behold the face of the Lord in judgment, him being righteous and them being um, lost, sinners, unsaved. And they shall not be satisfied with the likeness of the Lord. They will be cast out from his presence because they're, they are not um, image bearers in the spiritual, eternal sense of the Lord. Now, they were still created in the image of God, but they don't have Christ's image on them the likeness of Christ on them, which is the only way anyone stands before God and is seen righteous. So this is, I think, David's great hope. Why he's able to, in all things here, even as he's being uh, persecuted and, and pursued, he's able to know that God is just and know with assurance that whatever happens, whatever he sees, what, however it looks like evil is winning, those seeming victories of evil will really ultimately just be a judgment upon them. And it is the person who seeks their, their refuge in the Lord who ultimately is vindicated by the presence of the Lord instead of being judged and cast out of the presence of the Lord. Conclusion for today is, is a, que a question and a short answer. What does it look like to be vindicated by the Lord? What should we expect from a God who is the savior of those who seek refuge at his right hand? Is it temporary vindication in every circumstance where we've been wronged? It, it, is it for him to take us out of every instance of injustice in our lives and for all to be set right on this earth in every way so that no pain exists for us here? I would say that is not what the, the Bible tells us to expect. This is not even what David expects here. What David expects and what we should expect is that those in the shadow of his wings shall behold his face in righteousness and be satisfied with his likeness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us the right to be called sons of God, to one day stand in your presence, beholding your likeness, and for you to see Christ's likeness upon us and allow us to remain in your presence, looking upon your glory and not perishing. God, we so often hurt, so often see injustice is done and we wonder how you can stand by and look and seemingly bless those who are doing evil. But Lord, 
help us to keep this eternal perspective that these blessings that they seem to experience will be heaped upon them at the judgment seat. It is not a mercy. It is your judgment. And we will all be held to account for what we do with what you've given us. Most importantly, whether or not we submit to the salvation provided by your Son and live our lives being made by the Holy Spirit into the likeness of Christ. Help us to live that way every day. Help us to depend on you and your mercy and to seek refuge in the shadow of your wings. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I'll see you again.